What's up artists, my name is Ryan Talbot and today I'm going to be breaking down my specimen jar animations for you. I'm going to do my best to take you through as much of the process as I can in about 40 minutes. Obviously these take more than 40 minutes to complete, so I can't show you everything, but I'm going to be showing you some X particles, some sculpting tools, some texturing techniques, and by the end of it I hope you get something cool out of it. Alright, so let's jump right into it. So first of all, here's my eyeballs. Um, I did not model these. I got these off of cgtrader.com. Um, but if I actually play this back, you'll notice that each of the eyes are dilating individually. And that's just a simple pose morph trick. So if I actually come in here and grab my iris and I go into polygon mode, all I really did was I just grabbed a loop selection. So that's UL and I'm selecting both of those loops and basically just scale that in and add that as a pose and then scale that back out and I added that as a secondary pose. And then once you put that into your pose morph slider, um, you can just animate that throughout your animation. Um, so that's how I did that. Um, but anyways, let's just get into the more interesting part, which is how we're gonna generate these eyeballs around a brain-like surface. So we're actually gonna use an X particle system to do this. So I'm just gonna drop in my X particle system and real quick, I'm just gonna turn off that icon in the viewport. Um, and next we're going to need something to actually emit our particles around. Um, so let's just drop in a cylinder for this. And I'm just going to go and turn on my shading lines and we're going to want three different height segments for this cylinder. So I'm just going to turn that up to three right here. Um, and the reason for this is if we look back at our animation, um, we can see our brown eyes are on the top, our blue eyes are in the middle, and then we have our green eyes on the bottom. And then at some point, they all sort of separate and look in separate directions. So to achieve that, um, we're breaking this down into three different emitters. So let's just head back in here, and we have our three segments. So I'm just going to hit C to make that editable. And we won't be needing these caps, so I'm just going to quickly delete them. And we'll take our cylinder, and maybe we'll squish that down a little bit. Um, so now, uh, I'll just rename this tube emitter and I'm just going to quickly do a loop selection of this top area right here and I'm going to go up to select and I'm just going to add a set selection. So what I can do is I'll just rename this top and then I'm going to select the middle loop and add another set selection and we'll name this middle and then I'll set select the bottom loop and I will add another set selection tag and we'll name this one bottom. All right, cool. So next, why don't we just head into our emitter and I'll rename this top emit. And we wanna make sure that we are emitting from an object. And the object we wanna point our emitter to is our tube emitter that we just created. And in addition to this, I'm just gonna quickly lock that window into place. Um, we wanna drag in our top selection tag. So I'm just gonna drag this into our selection window. And now if I play this back, we should get particles spawning only from the top layer of our tube, which is what we want. But we need to change a few settings real quick. So I'm just going to head into emission and I'm going to change this from rate to shot um, because we just want to spawn our eyeballs. Um, we don't want them spawning at a rate. I'm also going to set my shot count to something like 50 and I'll replay this and now we just get uh, 50 particles spawning and that's it. We're also going to change our speed to zero. So let's replay that one more time. That way our particles just spawn and they stay in place. So coming back over to the object tab, I'm gonna change this from polygon center to polygon area. And now when we play this back, we're gonna get our particles spawning uh, more randomly around our cylinder. So to make this a little bit easier to see, I'm just gonna come over to my display tab and we'll turn this into spheres. So now when I play this back, we get a much better representation of what our eyes are looking like. So I'll head back over to my emission tab and I'll increase the radius to something like 8 and I'll add a variation of 2. So if I play this back one more time, you can see this is much closer to what we're going for. But there's still one problem. So our particles are intersecting with each other right now and we don't want that. So what we're going to do is we're going to go up to our dynamics tab and I'm going to unlock that window. And I'm just going to very quickly add in a particle to particle collision object. So now if I play this back, you can see our particles uh, don't want to touch each other. So they just start going flying in every which direction. Um, so let's add a couple modifiers in here to sort of wrangle those back into place. Um, the first one we're going to add is a follow surface modifier. So we're going to tell it to follow our tube emitter. And if I play this back one more time, 
Now our particles are doing their best to stick the, to the tube, um, but they're still kind of flying all around um, and going crazy. So we're gonna add one more modifier to this, and that is the drag modifier. So I'm gonna select my drag modifier, and I'm gonna change the density from air to water. And I'll play this back one more time. And now you can see we're getting our particles uh, sort of settling down into their place without touching each other. Um, so why don't we get our eyes in here? So I'm just gonna go into my generator and I'm going to add a generator object and I'll name this one top gen. And I'm just gonna come down here and grab my brown eyes and I'm gonna make them children of the generator. Um, and then the last thing I wanna do is I just wanna point this to our emitter and then I'll play this back and we're gonna get our eyeballs in there. Um, but right off the bat, um, there's a couple problems. Uh, first of all, to make this easier to see, I'll head back into our display and we'll just display our particles as circles. And now we can see our eyeballs much better. But there's another issue, which is that our viewport just became really slow. So the way we can actually fix this is by, I'm just gonna do a quick search for eyeball, and that's gonna bring up all my subdivision objects. So I'm just gonna change the subdivision editor right here from three to zero. And now if I play this back, you can see we're getting a much lighter playback speed. Um, and this is something we can work with. And because our subdivision renderer is still three, um, once we go to render this, uh, it's gonna be nice and smooth like it was before. All right, so the next thing we wanna do is we want to add a controller in here to basically tell the particles where to look. So we'll just drop a null in here and I'll rename this top control. And we're just gonna change some display settings here from dot to hexagon and I'll make this something like 35 centimeters and maybe I'll add some color to it as well. And since this is our brown eye layer, I'll make this more of an orangey hue and I'll hit okay. And let's just, uh, make sure our null is actually in front of our cylinder. And we'll just come into our front view right here. And if I drag this over to the side, um, you can see it's a bit easier to see it now. So now all we need to do is we just need to come into our emitter and under the extended data tab, we wanna tell these to look at our controller. So let's tap on use rotation and let's change the rotation mode from set to face object. And the object we want it to face is our top controller. So I'll just connect that right there. And when I play this back, you can see our eyes are now staring at the null. So now what's kind of nice is that we can actually move this around and our eyes are always gonna be tracking that null right there. Pretty cool. So now all we need is a way to record this data. Um, so why don't we just do Shift C to do a search for cappuccino. And this is just a nifty little tool that allows us to record our keyframes in real time. So I'll just go back to frame zero and I'll tap start real time. And you'll see once I start to move this null around, we're now recording that path. So now I can play this back and you can see, voila, we have our keyframes. So basically, um, all I would do was I would repeat this process two more times, um, creating a second emitter for the middle um, and a second controller null, as well as another generator um, to create our three individual layers. So the, the last thing I wanna show is also how I created this sort of brain that all of our eyeballs are set inside of. So why don't we just do that real quick? So I'll just drop a cylinder in here and I'm gonna size it up so that it's sort of intersecting with my eyes and I'll size it down like that. And I'm gonna go over and I'm going to turn on fillet for the caps and let's just go into our garage shading lines and I'm going to increase the segments until we get a dense, uh, evenly distributed mesh that we can work with. So I'll turn up my segments uh, in here as well. And that's looking pretty good. Um, so once I'm happy with that, I'll just do Shift C and I'll do a search for a collision deformer. And so I'll drop that in as a child of my cylinder, which I'll just rename brains. And what we need to do is we just need to come in here to our collider tab and we need to tell it to collide with our top generator. Um, and you'll see when I play this back, nothing's happening. So what we actually need to do is we need to go into our top generator and we need to tell it to clone it as create instances instead of straight clones. Um, so now when I play this back, you can see our collision deformer is doing its best to wrap itself around those eyeballs, but that's still not quite what we're looking for. So why don't we come down into our collider and we're gonna change the solver from intersect to outside volume. And you can see straight away, 
uh, it's just going to suck that mesh in behind the eyeballs. So I'm just going to come over and display our grid shading and going to zoom in here. And you can see our viewport is quite a bit slower at this point, um, but we're getting this kind of ugly fong tearing happening right here. So I'll just go over to my fong tag and I'll increase this to 180 degrees and voila, we fixed it, no problem. Um, so basically, that's about it for the eyeballs. Um, so what I would do is repeat this process and I'll just jump over to my finished project file and we can see what this would look like. All right, so that's pretty much it for the eyeballs. Uh, next, I'm gonna move on to the snake jar. Next, let's jump into our snake project and I'm gonna start showing you how I started to sculpt that out. So we're just gonna start off with a regular old cylinder um, and right away, if I try to make this editable and I go into my sculpting layout and I take my grab tool, um, you can see uh, this is not going to work for us um, because there's really no information here in the topology. So I'm just gonna undo that real quick and what I need to do is I actually need to remesh this. And so I find that the fastest and easiest way to remesh anything in Cinema 4D is using an X Particles VDB mesher. So I'm just going to drop that in there and you can see it's immediately going to project um, some evenly distributed geometry onto our cylinder, which is what we want. Um, and if you're using R20, of course, you can use the volume builder, which is going to do the same exact thing. So anyways, I'll just take this and hit C to make it editable and we'll head back into our sculpting layout and you can see now we have a mesh that we can actually start working with here. All right, cool. So quickly, I'll just um, go over a couple of these brush settings here. Um, I would like to keep on link symmetry, link pressure, and link size. And what that's going to do is just going to make sure that if I select a different brush here, um, it's going to transfer all of our settings over. So let's say I turned on symmetry and I'm painting in symmetry, which is all fine. And then I want to switch over to the knife tool. It's actually going to remember um, all of my brush settings. So that's just kind of nice. Um, the other thing before we actually do start sculpting on this is we want to hit this subdivide button right here. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a sculpting tag for us. And now everything we do from here on out is going to happen within the sculpting tag. Um, that way we're not destroying our original mesh. Um, so the first thing I'm going to want to do is I'm going to create some neck flaps. So I'm just going to turn on my mask right here and maybe scale up my brush. And I'm going to do my best to just draw a straight line down the middle. And then I'm going to hold down shift. And when I do that, it's going to let me smooth this out. And you'll see why that's going to be helpful in a second. So next what I can do is I can invert this mask and I can take my grab tool and I'll just scale it up a little bit and I can start pulling this out. But there's actually an issue that we're running into here. So it's not pulling out in the direction that we want it to. So all we have to do is we just need to come in and we need to constrain the direction from mouse to the x-axis. Now no matter which way we pull our mouse, it's always going to pull it out perfectly on the x-axis like so. So let me redo that one more time. And let's just say I'm happy with something like that. So then I'll clear that mask and I'll scale down my brush. And if I hold down shift, I can start to smooth this out. And so that's another nifty uh, thing to know is that no matter which brush you have selected, as long as you're holding down shift, it will turn it into the smoothing tool. All right, so I got my ne neck flaps going. Um, next, why don't we get sculpting on the head? Um, but before I get into that, I want to go over quickly reference and the importance of using reference images. Um, so we're just gonna sort of uh, soak in uh, these images right here and uh, make sure we're taking into account what snakes actually look like. So we're noticing that they have this triangular shaped head, um, this nice bulging around the eyes, and then this rounded off nose right here. And then I also decided to include a picture of my pet lizard Spock because uh, he actually shares a lot of the same features as the snake head. So he's got that same bulging happening around the eyes, he's got that triangular shaped head, and that rounded off nose. Um, and then I also included this picture right here. And what this is, is kind of what can happen if we don't forget, or if we do forget to include skeletons. So our skeletons uh, define a lot about what we look like, and we don't even think about it a lot. Um, but our skin is basically just a layer that is being tightly wrapped around our skeleton. Um, so that's just one more thing to keep in mind when we're sculpting our snake. 
All right, so I'll go in here and I'm just gonna hold down shift and I'm gonna start smoothing this out. And maybe I'll take my flatten tool and I'll scale this down and I'll just start flattening that out um, on the underside of the neck. Um, I'm also using control middle mouse to drag out and that changes my brush size. And if I hold control middle mouse and drag up and down, that will change the pressure of the brush as well. So I'm just going to start uh, start sculpting on here and defining these areas. So then maybe I'll go back to my grab tool and I'll change our direction back to mouse and I'll just start pulling out um, some of these areas over here. And maybe I'll take this and I'll squish down the nose so we get something that looks a little bit more like a snake. Um, and now you can see we're just barely getting started um, to chip away at the shape of our snake. So I'll come over to my inflate tool and I'll scale this down and I'm just going to hold down control. And what control is going to do is the inverse operation of whatever tool you're using. So I'm going to hold control to push in where the eyeball is going to go roughly. And you can see if I don't hold control by default, the inflate tool is going to pull out on my mesh. And then I'm just going to hold down shift to smooth out some of these areas right here. And maybe I'll take my inflate tool and I'll actually start um, adding that bulging around the eyes that we were noticing earlier. All right, and then I'm just going to hold down shift to smooth that out some more. And you can see if I start trying to add too much detail on here, um, I'll take my wax tool and I'll start adding some brush strokes on the top. We're actually running into some resolution issues. Um, now that's no big deal because all we have to do is we just have to tap our subdivide button and that's just going to give us another level of subdivision to work with. So now um, I might just want to take my grab tool and scale it way up and I might want to actually just like push that nose down a little bit. Maybe that was too much. Um, maybe I'll scale this up even more and I'll just grab that and start pulling that down a little bit and maybe we'll pull the whole thing that way as well. And yeah, we could go Bob Ross on this for a long time, um, adding in details until it's uh, looking more like a snake. But uh, for the sake of this demonstration, I don't want to get too deep into it. Um, so I'm just going to basically cover the basics of what I'm doing here and then move on. All right, so let's say we're happy with that. Uh, maybe to make this a little bit more interesting, We'll add some spikes on the top of our snake head because that always makes it look a little bit cooler. Um, and maybe I'll just rough out where I'm going to put the mouth as well. So I'll just take my knife tool and I'll scale that down and increase the pressure. And I'm just going to rough out where that would go, like so. And maybe I'll do that a couple times. And then what I can actually use is the pinch tool to start sealing that mouth back together. And there you go. Um, so that's roughly what the mouth is going to be looking like. Um, so maybe I'll show you next um, uh, how I would add some spikes on the back. So what's cool about the sculpting tag is that we can actually add layers. So I'll add a new layer and I'll name it spikes and I'll go to my grab tool and I'll just start uh, painting some spikes on the back of this guy. All right. Um, and what's cool about us doing this on a different layer is that we can actually mix down the strength of our spikes. So if it's too strong, we can always mix them down until we're happy with them or make them disappear altogether. And I could also see this being used um, for pose morphing. So let's say you wanted to create an animation where uh, spikes start jetting out of your creature. Um, you could create two different poses for that as well. Um, so there's one more trick I want to show you, um, and that's using the masking tool. So let's say I wanted to create a symmetrical pattern on the back of this guy. And I just want to create a somewhat interesting texture going on. And let's just say we're happy with this. So what I can do is I can actually invert this mask. I can take my inflate tool and I'll just scale it way up. And then I'm just going to tap on this a couple times and then I'm just gonna hold down shift and tap on it again to smooth it back out. And then I can clear that mask. And now we have an interesting bump texture happening on the back of our snake. So uh, once again, we can always mix this down if we feel like it's too strong. And we can, uh, yeah, 
until we have something we're happy with. So moving on to the next section, um, I will just show you how I would UV unwrap this. So what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna first rename this snake, and then I'm just gonna go into my BP UV edit layout. And this is by no means the best way to UV unwrap anything. Um, this is just simply how I did it. So I would just tap my paint setup wizard, and I'm just gonna hit next, and I'm just gonna hit next again, hit finish, and it's just gonna very quickly generate some UVs for me. And now um, with, if we take our brush tool, and we can actually start painting on this, and we can see that our snake is now unwrapped. Um, so if we come over here, we can see that it actually unwrapped our original cylinder um, and our sculpts, because it's all happening in the sculpt tag, happens on top of that. Um, so that just makes our UVs a little bit cleaner. So then the next thing I would do um, for the animation is I would drop in a helix spline here and we'll just isolate that real quick. And I basically just start messing with these helix settings right here. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a spline wrap around this helix. So I'll turn up the end angle to something like 5,000 and then I'll turn up the height to maybe something like 1,000. Um, and then I'll change some of these other settings like the radial bias as well. Um, but first I need to change the end radius size. And now we can change the, the radial bias and you can see what that's sort of doing. Um, and then I can change the height bias as well to make most of these sort of curl up at the bottom. Um, and basically just keep messing with this until I get something that I'm happy with. And maybe we can decrease the height a little bit and we'll change the end angle to something like 3000. Um, and basically we just keep doing this until we get something that we're happy with. Um, so I'll just do a quick search for a spline wrap and I'll make my snake a, uh, or sorry, I'll make the spline wrap a child of the snake and I'm gonna point that to our helix spline. So then I'll unhide that and nothing's gonna happen because we need to freeze our sculpt first. So I'm just gonna freeze this and I'm going to allow deformations and now it's doing its best to wrap it around but on the wrong axis. So we're gonna change that from X to Y and now we're getting something that is more closely resembling what we're going for but still not quite. So let's change the mode from fit spline real quick to keep length. And now you can see our snake is coiled up in there and it's upside down so I'm just gonna turn up my rotation down here and turn that around real quickly. And then, uh, yeah, so basically to animate this, all I did was I took the offset and I just animated it from zero up here until it sort of swirls up at the top and now it's coming towards the camera. Um, so I would do some more editing to this helix spline uh, until I get something that I'm actually happy with. So let's just jump over to my other project and I'll show you what that ends up looking like. So this is the actual sculpt and this is uh, what it ends up looking like when it's in the helix spline. So another uh, thing that I did though was I actually edited this helix spline a little bit. Um, so we'll take a look at our primitive and I'll just show you how I did that real quick. So first, uh, you just gotta make it editable. So I'm just gonna hit C and then I'm just gonna select um, some of these points right here and delete them. And I just wanna create this hook at the end of our helix spline to finish it off. So I'm gonna hold control to drag out a new point and I'll just start finessing this and moving it around. Um, and you can see it's gonna be pretty choppy at first um, and a little bit difficult to get this in the right spot. But there's a tool that will help us with that, which is the spline smooth tool. So I'm just doing shift C again to search for our spline smooth. And if I just start smoothing this out right here, now you can see um, we're getting that nice hook shape that we were going for and voila. So now you can see once again, this is what our finished helix spline is looking like. And I'll turn on our snake. And now you can see what it looks like wrapped around there. Cool. So if all that made sense, um, I'm just going to move on to the texturing section of the snake now. So I'm just going to hop over into my octane view real quick and we'll turn that on. And I'm just going to undock this. Whoa, where did our window go? All right, we're going to undock this and we're going to load up our material. And I'm going to open up that node editor and we're going to try and dock these two together. And I'm just going to quickly uh, go through how I built this material. All right. 
Let's see if I can move that camera around. All right, so we're basically starting off with uh, two grunge maps. So let me solo this first one for you. And I got this off of the French Monkey's website, and I believe it was one of his freebies. So this is the map you're looking at here, just wrapped around the snake. Um, and I took that and I piped it into a gradient node. So I'll just solo the gradient and that just adds some nice reds and greens in there. Um, and then just to add an extra level of variation, I added a second grunge map, which is this one. And it's a lot lower resolution, but it's no big deal. Um, so we're just gonna pipe that into our own a second uh, gradient node. And we're just gonna recolor that to be sort of tannish to white. And what happens when we mix these two gradients together is we get even more variation. So that's what ends up happening when we mix those two grunge maps together. Um, and that's pretty much all we have in the color channel. Um, in addition, I also added a dirt node in here. And if I solo that, you'll see that's revealing a lot of detail um, around the head area and in all of these creases right here. And really, um, the dirt map combined with the displacement is doing much of the heavy lifting in this material. So if I disable solo and we look at the whole material again, um, all these scales that you're seeing right here is happening in the displacement. And if I unplug that dirt node, if I unplug that dirt node, now we're not seeing any of that detail anymore. So it's the same exact material just with no dirt node. So I'll plug that back in. And let's take a look at the displacement channel. So the map I used for the scales um, was created by Travis Davids. Um, it was one of his freebies as well. He put it up on Gumroad. And this is what it looks like. And it's just a really nice high-res displacement map. Um, so you can see if I unplug that displacement from the dirt, um, you can see our dirt node no longer uh, has the displacement to work with anymore. So once again, our material starts to fall apart without uh, our displacement and our dirt map working together. So um, that's pretty much it for the texturing of the snake. So next I wanted to move on and show you guys a little bit about how I built the labels. So let's take a look again at our finished animation. And so now I'm just going to be breaking down how I added the wrinkles into here and how I created the texture maps as well as used a collision deformer to make them snug up against the jar. So let's jump over to that real quick. All right, so we're in our label project file. Um, basically, we're just using a regular old plane. We just want to make sure it's got an even number of segments um, so that you know, it's evenly distributed. Um, and then we're just going to do a quick search for a collision deformer, similar to what we did with the eyeball before. And we're just going to tell it to look at the jar as our collider. So now this should just work, um, and I'm just going to snug that up against the jar and voila. So I'll just take this and I'll turn it into an editable object and I'll just hide our original right there. And we're gonna take this and we're gonna start sculpting on it. So let's just go back into our sculpting mode and I'm gonna tap our subdivide button to add our sculpting tag once again. So now I'm actually just going to subdivide this a few more times until we get a nice level of detail on our mesh. And I'll just go to our grab tool and we're gonna be using a stamp on this to create our wrinkles. So I'm gonna tap use stamp and I'm gonna to navigate to that asset. And I'm using brush frab fabric wrinkle bed sheet 07. And I got this from polygon.com. So you can see this is what it's looking like. Um, so I'll just load in our 4K Photoshop file. All right, and I'm still in symmetry mode, so I'm just gonna quickly turn that off. And if I start painting on this, you can see we're getting some nice wrinkles. Um, but there's one problem, and this becomes more apparent if I start pulling out um, and exaggerating this. Um, we're getting this ugly polygon tearing happening. And so what we need to do is we just need to restrict the direction from mouse to normal. And now, um, no matter which way we pull our mouse, um, as long as we're pulling this out, um, it's always going to pull it perfectly in the direction of our normal map. So that's nice. And then I might hold down shift to smooth this out a little bit. And one more thing I can do is I can come over here and I can rotate our stamp. Um, that way they're not all perfectly exactly the same. And I might smooth this out some more. I might come over here and start pulling these out again. Uh, maybe I'll rotate it. Just adding some more nice detail into there. And then I'll maybe uh, scale it up and just do one big one in the middle. I don't know. 
and I was told shift to sort of smooth that out one more time. And let's say we're happy with that and we like our wrinkles. So we're still working with a really dense mesh right here. And I actually learned this trick from Aaron Covert's NAB 2019 presentation. And he shows a really cool trick where you can actually use this bake sculpt objects button down here and you can actually bake down all of that detail into our low poly mesh. So what I'll do is I'll first set an output path and I'll put that in our assets folder and I'll just name it label bake and we'll hit OK. And 8K is a bit overkill so maybe we'll try just a 2K texture. And we're going to tap on normal in displacement and if I hit preview here we're starting to see something. Um, it's hard to see but it's easier to preview if we just preview our normal. So I'll preview that and we're going to notice that our normal is actually inverted. Um, so I'm not sure why this happens, um, but there is an easy fix for it. So we can just go to our settings and we can flip the Z axis. And if I just hit preview again, voila, our normal is now facing the right direction. So lastly, uh, we just want to make sure that we're baking from our top level, which is our dense mesh, level three, to level zero, which is our low poly optimized mesh. So whenever I'm ready, I'm just going to hit bake and it's going to ask me to overwrite the files. I'm going to hit OK. And now it has created a copy of our sculpt. Um, but this time, the displacement is in the displacement channel. Um, and all that detail is baked into the normal as well. So I can come in here and I can hit render. And you can see we're getting that displacement in there and those nice wrinkles. All right, so next I'm just going to show you how I built the texture maps in Photoshop. So I'm just going to jump over and we'll do that. All right, so Google Images is your friend, guys. Um, just type in tape texture and you're gonna get a million results. That's all I did here. And even though this is a really low res image, we're actually gonna be able to extract some information from it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to go up to select and we're gonna select a color range. And you can see I've already selected the tape, um, but if I just select outside, you can see what it's doing. So we're just gonna select the tape and we're gonna make sure that our fuzziness is at a level where we have the whole thing selected, but it's not eating into our background. So maybe somewhere around 69 or 70 will be good. So we'll just hit OK, and that's gonna create a selection for us. And all I have to do is in the bottom right corner, hit this Add Layer Mask button. And now if I turn off the background, you can see that it's created our mask. But what I can actually do is I can Alt click on the mask itself, and that's gonna give us a black and white image and we, what's cool about this is we can actually paint over this. So I have my brush selected and I'll press X to paint white and you can see we have some resolution issues at the top and bottom. So if I wanted to just sort of fix that up, all I would have to do is hold down shift um, to draw a straight line across and sort of paint over that. Um, but in addition to that, uh, what we really want to use this for, since we're painting the opacity map right now, is we want to layer up areas. You know when you're uh, peeling off a label or something and it never comes off completely and there's always those ugly uh, layers underneath the tape? So basically that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to emulate that. So I'll hit X to go to my black brush and uh, we can also use the number pad to control the opacity of our brush real quick. So if I press 1, that's going to give us 10% opacity. If I hit 3, that's going to give us 30%, 6, 60%, 0, 100%, and then everything in between. So I'll just undo that, and maybe we'll go to like 30% opacity, and I'm just going to start painting on here. And having a tablet and a pen is actually a lot more useful for this, because you can, you can really get in there and paint the details. Right now I'm using a mouse uh, just for this demonstration. But you can see how uh, we could get in here and maybe even reduce the hardness of our brush a little bit to start painting in um, some revealing opacity layers underneath. And so let's say uh, I went ahead and I worked on this for a little bit longer. Um, what I would end up with is something that looks like this. So then I would just take this and I'll just go up and I'll export it as a PNG map and there you go, that's our opacity map. Um, so then on top of that, we want to add our writing. So real quick, um, I'm just gonna grab my tablet. So I'm back and I got my tablet right here and I'm gonna start doing some writing on this. So let's make sure our brush is set to white and I'm gonna make sure my hardness is 100% and we're gonna scale down this brush and uh, I want to show you this smoothing option up here. So if I turn this off to 0% and we start writing at 100% opacity, 
um, you can see it's really easy to get these ugly jitters in here, um, which aren't very natural looking, um, especially if you're writing cursive. So to sort of exaggerate this, I'll turn this up to like 75%. And I'm drawing the same line, but now you can see it's actually averaging out our brush strokes to give us something a bit smoother. So this is great for writing cursive. So I'm just going to turn this down to something like 25%. And let's try writing our text. And there you go. So that's our writing. Uh, so then what I would do is I would just do a quick color overlay on this and we'll just make it black. Um, hit OK, and then I would export this as its own texture map as well. All right, so we got our textures. Um, let's jump back into Cinema 4D and let's start plugging these maps in. So I'm just going to jump over into my Octane layout, and I'm going to turn this on, and we'll undock this real quick. And real quick, I'm also going to convert my material to Octane, and I'm going to go up to Function, and I'm going to remove unused materials. So that's just going to remove anything that's not applied to an object currently. So let's open up that label material, and I'll dock these two windows together. And maybe I'll turn off my jar as well, so that we can see this a little bit better. And what is happening here? Let's, let's try reloading. And there we go, our label texture is back. Um, all right, there we go. So let's just start messing with the displacement first of all, because it's looking a little wacky. Um, I'm actually also going to invert this and see if that fixes anything. It's not really working. Um, I'll change up the level of detail to something like 2K first, and we'll see if that helps. And maybe we'll, the amount will just be one, uh, like that. And it seems like it's backwards right now. So let's come in here, and let's invert that normal. And there you go. Um, so the, I guess the normal wasn't inverted after all. Um, so we're just switching that back to the correct direction. And let's start loading in some image textures. So the first one I'm going to load in is our opacity map. So let's go grab our tape opacity, open that up, and plug that directly into our opacity channel. All right, so right off the bat, um, first of all, let me zoom in on this a little bit. Um, so we're just going to invert this real quick. And now we can see we got our nice opacity going on. Um, so next, let's add in another image texture. And we're going to add in our text this time. So I'll open that up, and I'll plug this into the diffuse channel. Um, so it comes in upside down, but that's no problem. Uh, we can just quickly rotate that around with a transform node, and voila. So next, let's add in a paper texture. And since we, we did black on white text, um, all we have to do is drop in a multiply node in here and mix our text with our paper texture, and it should be all good and dandy. So I'll plug that in there, and here's our second image texture. Now let's load in that paper. So once again, I just went to Google Images and typed in paper texture. You'll get a million things popping up. Uh, so then I'll just pull that in there, and voila. Um, I might want to scale this up a little bit so we can see a bit more of the texture going on, although it's still a pretty plain texture. Um, so there's one more thing I want to add in here, and I want to add some additional detail into the normals. So I'm going to load in one more image, one last image, and let's come in here and let's add our fabric wrinkles. So this is another one that I got off of polygon.com. Um, so it's just a fabric normal map, and what we need to do is we need to mix these two together. So I'll just bring a mix node in here, and we have our normal map as texture one, and we have our second normal map as texture two. And it's a bit hard to see right now, but if I actually scale this up to something like five, now we're starting to see that detail in there. And if I unconstrain our, uh, our scale, um, I'll make our X something like two, and now we can start to see a little bit better what's going on there. And to make this a little bit more obvious, I could turn up the strength to two. And now you should really start to be seeing that extra fabric normal in there, along with our wrinkles. And there you go. Um, that's basically how I created the labels for our specimen jars. So to wrap this all up, I figured I'll just jump over to my finished project file and just sort of walk through a little bit of the environment.
So this is the rest of our scene. Um, the jar was nothing fancy, so basically we just have a cylinder on the inside with um, a specular material, that's our liquid. And then on top of that we have another cylinder, um, and that is inside of a cloth nerves to just give it a little bit of thickness, and that's our glass material. Um, modeling the lid was also pretty straightforward, um, so this is also using the VDB mesher. So if I turn this off, you can see, actually, I have a few primitive objects in here. I got like three different cylinders, um, and then I just drop those all into our VDB mesher, which then smooths it out and meshes them into one object. Um, so for our background, um, if I load up my Octane view once again, we'll see that our background is literally just an image plane. And it's a bit dark in here, so let me just turn up the exposure on my camera. And now we can see a little bit better. Uh, once again, Google Images is your friend, guys. I just typed in like abandoned laboratory um, and got something like that. And even though it's obviously a plane while we're rotating around in this wide shot, uh, once we head into our camera and it's out of focus, and as long as you have minimal to no camera movement, um, it's just as convincing as if you built out a full-on environment, I think. Um, so yeah. And I also, I chose to go with only lighting this with a single HDRI and nothing else because I wanted this to be a pretty moody scene. So you can see um, in the reflection here, it's mostly being lit by this skylight in our HDRI. So I'll just jump over to our wide shot again and you can see that happening there. Um, and then rather than artificially boosting the light of our HDRI to make the scene brighter, um, I just decided to increase the exposure on the camera um, like I showed you. And yeah, that's pretty much it, guys. Um, so the spider webs are generated using a spider web generator plugin. Um, so basically, you just have these nulls right here. And you can, if I just pause my render, um, I can drag this around uh, and it just connects them with the spider web. Uh, then I'll just apply an octane tag to this. And uh, I just turn on hair rendering. And I'll just set the thickness to something super thin. That way you can barely see it. And I didn't even bother to add a material onto it just because it's so thin. Um, and yeah, that's all I had prepared. Um, so thank you for listening. Um, I hope you got something out of this. Um, if you enjoyed it, please let me know. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, and free feel free to send me a message on Instagram. I go by Digital Melon. Or of course, leave a comment uh, here on YouTube as well. And uh, yeah, that's all I got for you guys. And uh, peace out.